Good morning and welcome again. My name is Tim. I am one of the pastors here at Redemption Hill. It is uh, truly a joy to be able to gather together with you, uh, to be together, to sing, to pray, to lament, to hear God's word together. <clears throat> I was, I was uh, riding with my seven-year-old daughter yesterday, my wife and son were at a, at a youth group event, and so I took her out to dinner, just the two of us, and uh, this summer she started learning to play the piano, and she loves it, and she's, she's practicing all the time to try to get better, and so she knew I was working on, on uh, my sermon all week, and so she said very, very sweetly, Dad, maybe I can help you with your, your sermon, uh, which was very nice, and then, uh, then she asked if I practiced my sermons like she practices piano, and I said, no, not, not, not really. And she said, well, you should start. Um, maybe you'll get better. And uh, so, so I come in here full of confidence telling you I did not practice this sermon. Um, I, know, uh, I know for many of us, this, is, this has been a long week, a hard week. I know it has been uh, for me personally. Um, I don't know what hard has looked like for you. Um, but I imagine that, that many of us have felt um, overwhelmed by anxiety, disappointment, confusion, uh, discouragement, heartache. These are all very natural things to feel. Our family went last weekend to watch uh, Inside Out 2, and we all loved it. And the movie is breaking all sorts of records. And a big part of the appeal to that uh, movie is the subject matter. It is a subject matter that almost all of us can relate to. Joy, sadness, anxiety, embarrassment, fear are all very common to life. And sometimes those emotions and circumstances that you find yourself in, that you're feeling, um, can also be very isolating. They can make you feel like you're the only one in the world dealing with these things. And, and you look around at other people and you wonder, are they going through this? Am I the only one dealing with anxiety right now? Am I the only one dealing with sadness? Um, is everyone else's life free of worry? And, and that movie reminds us that we are not alone, that those feelings are very, very common to our human experience. And, and that's one of the reasons that I love the Bible uh, so much. It is, it is also very clear that experiencing things like fear, anxiety, disappointment, they are common to our human experience. I love that, especially that the Psalms uh, don't shy away from those realities and those feelings. Um, they don't shy away from the fact that, that we are feeling a discouragement, that we experience heartbreak. But we are also offered a unique hope, a, a hope that is, is specific and unique to Christianity. And so I am thankful that God's Word not only gives us commands that we are meant to follow, but He God also gives us the words to express our grief, our sorrow, our struggle, our questions. We see again and again lament and grieving and brokenness in the Psalms. David and others cry out to God in the midst of their suffering. We need to be able to express our grief and our sorrow. They often feel guilty as Christians expressing those things, but God gives us the words to do that. It is, it is okay to weep over loss. It is, it is good to grieve over sin and suffering. Uh, Mark Rogop, a, a pastor in Indianapolis, has written a wonderful book entitled Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, where he talks about the Psalms and says this, while the psalmist knows that God is in control, there are times when it feels like he's not. And it seems that pain, suffering, and injustice rule the day. Lament and the Psalms invite us to talk to God about it. The Psalms give us a, a, a godly response to that pain, suffering, and injustice. We're given a way to respond through the words of the Psalms. It is very natural to feel overwhelmed by difficult circumstances. And uh, so I am glad that we are spending the summer in Psalms and Proverbs. Uh, we will again and again turn to and see those who are hurting and lamenting, but also those who turn to God as their only hope. 
And so Psalm 34 is where we're at today, and it helps us see where do we go when those feelings are overwhelming. Psalm 34 was written at potentially David's lowest point in his life. He wrote this feeling alone. He, is, he was fearful as he ran away from his enemies. We all need help to know where do we go, where do we turn when, when it feels like everywhere around us is, is difficulty, when all we can see is fear and anxiety. David is, is hurt, he's scared, he's heartbroken, he is on the run, but he is reminded that God is near and that God is for him and that God will fulfill all of his promises. I need to be reminded of this today, and I believe all of us as a church need to be reminded of that today. So uh, today specifically, I'm going to ask, uh, as you are able, to stand one more time, and we're going to read uh, this together. We're going to read Psalm chapter 34, verses 1 through 10. So stand with me. This is Psalm chapter 34, verses 1 through 10. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Let's pray together. Father, um, we, we need you. We, 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 we say that a lot. We recognize it in our minds. But, uh, Father, we feel it in our, in our hearts and in our bones. And we need you. We need you for everything. And so we turn to you today. Um, we cry out to, to you today and trust that you are going to hear us that you were going to do what you alone can do, that you were going to save, you were going to deliver, you're going to redeem, you're going to heal. Father, um, uh, help us with that today. Sh strengthen us um, for, for our week ahead and for the days ahead. Um, encourage us and turn our eyes and our hearts and our faces to you today. Um, we need to see you more than we need to see anything else in this world. And so we give all that to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. Psalm 34 uh, starts with a short introduction that tells us the setting of where David was when he wrote this psalm. It says simply this, a psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. Now, that little introduction does a lot for us. It points us back to a story uh, that we went through as a church a couple of years ago. It points us back to a story in chapter 21 of 1 Samuel. David had been anointed to be the successor to King Saul. David had, had already killed the champion of the Philistine army, the giant Goliath. Uh, Goliath was from the city of Gath. The people of Israel were singing songs about the greatness of David. They were singing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David, David has slain his tens of thousands. Uh, King Saul apparently was not a big fan of that song. And so we are told that Saul became angry and sought to kill David. And David actually finds this out from his closest friend, Jonathan. And so to save his life, he begins to run. He, he runs to the city of Gath, the, the city that Goliath was from. Goliath, who was well known in the city of, of Gath. He was a giant, probably the best known soldier there. So he runs away from a king that wants to kill him, and he runs to a city where probably everyone there wants to kill him. 
And once he's there, they recognize him, and they capture David, and they take him to the king, uh, King Achish, also known as King Abimelech. And David, David found the one group of people that probably hated him worse than Saul. David trying to stay alive, desperately, just doing his best, he comes up with a plan, and his plan is to act like he is out of his mind. Uh, in this culture, it was bad luck to mess with a madman, and so the king looks at David as he is acting like he is out of his mind and has this response, I already have enough madmen in Gath that you bring me another one. Just leave this guy alone and let him be. Somehow this plan works, and they let him go. And then David flees from Gath into the wilderness and goes and hides in a cave and as he breathes a sigh of relief, it is likely that in this cave, David writes this psalm. This is a low point in his life. Uh, he's not, he hasn't escaped danger altogether. There are still those who want to kill him. He had said goodbye to his closest friend, Jonathan, uncertain if he would ever see him again. David was still on the run from King Saul and his army, and he, he runs away from Saul, and he runs right to the king of the Philistines another king that wants him dead. David was on the run, hungry, no resources, and he felt alone. And yet, as David looks at how God has saved him up until this point, he starts this psalm with, I will bless the Lord at all times. Upon reflecting on this crisis and where he's been and where he is at, it is in this context that he starts with, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. David starts here with, with a reminder for himself and for others that in any and every situation, at all times, we should bless the Lord and praise should never leave our mouths. This is where the Bible is, is clearly different from the rest of the world. We can all watch inside out and agree that there are difficult times and it's very natural and right to feel certain emotions. But in the midst of our most difficult times, the Bible says that we can do something that is very unique. We can bless and praise and magnify God. This isn't natural. This isn't something that we can do. This is something that is not possible apart from God. When life is, is, is not going how we want it to, when situations are harder than we feel like we can handle, we don't naturally start to praise God. My wife and I moved to Richmond from Charlottesville around 15 years ago now. And for a year before we moved here and a couple years after that, we went through a prolonged period of time where I felt like God was not on our side. I felt like God wasn't hearing us. He didn't seem to care about us. He, didn't, he didn't, definitely didn't seem to care about what we were going through. We had moved to Charlottesville with, the, with the, the hope to plant a church, and that had failed. We were in the middle of trying to start a family to have children, and we just experienced a lot of loss. There was, there was many other disappointments, and it just seemed like disappointment was just heaped on top of failure and grief. We had a cat at the time, and, and the cat had developed kidney stones, and we were told if the cat didn't have surgery, he was going to die. And the vet, vet told us how much that surgery was going to cost, and it was pretty much everything we had left in our bank account and then some. And I'm looking at our lives, and I'm looking at God, and I'm looking at the cat, and, and, and I really don't even like the cat. Um, <laughs> But, but my wife did, and, and all I'm thinking is, no, God, you can't take the cat too. Um, we, 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 so we spent all the money we had left to save that cat, and that cat just never died. Um, just lived forever. Um, we, we, we felt alone. We were, we were dealing with failure, with loss. With physical struggles, we had no money left. And the last thing, honestly, that was on my mind was, I will bless the Lord at all times. The last thing that I was thinking was, man, I just want to praise God continually. 
I need to praise God for all, he, all he's done. I was only thinking, God, why are you so intent on taking things from us? Why don't you want us to have anything good? It is much more human and natural to say, even as Christians, I will praise the Lord sometimes. Sometimes when, when things are okay or good, I will, I will praise him. And then sometimes I'm just going to cry out and complain to the Lord. It feels more honest to say when times are good, I will bless the Lord. And when times are difficult, I will not. And David shows us here what an amazing gift that we have that God has given to his people. God has given us the ability to praise God and at the same time cry out to him for help. We have the ability to, to bless God and magnify God and at the same time still wonder and question. We can do those things at the same time. We are able to weep and rejoice at the same time. We are even called to do that for others. It's not something we can do apart from God, but in Him we can. This psalm is a psalm for, for those who feel alone and overwhelmed. It is a psalm for those who feel like they have nothing at all to hang their hat on, for those who feel uncertain about what the future holds. It is for people who find themselves at the absolute lowest point in life, which is where David probably was. Throughout this chapter, he talks about his fears and his troubles. In verse 19, he speaks as the one who is afflicted. In verse 18, the one who is brokenhearted the one who is crushed in spirit. David isn't on the mountaintop right now. And he's not ignoring the difficulty of life. He's not ignoring the emotions that feel overwhelming. This is a psalm for, for the brokenhearted and the one who is crushed in spirit. It is a psalm for those who are crying out in the midst of difficult situations. It is a psalm for those who feel troubled and fearful. And yet, to those, David starts by saying, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be on my mouth. David then expands on this by pro proclaiming in verses 2 and 3, My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. The more we are needy, the more humbled we are, the more we are prepared to praise and exalt and magnify and boast only in the Lord. We can either proclaim how great we are or we can proclaim how great God is. This boasting, it is, it is to take pride in something. For us as Christians, we take pride, we brag on God. Pride is being enamored and consumed with ourselves. The humble are enamored and consumed with God. Therefore, it takes humility to boast in the Lord because it means you are not preoccupied with only yourself, but with God and his greatness. Pride will always keep us from seeing how great God truly is. We are often guilty of being very prideful, even as Christians. David had a lot he could boast about. He could have used this psalm to add additional verses to the songs that were already being sung, about the, the victories that he had won, the strength that he had shown. But when David looked back at all that had happened, David did not talk about his strength. He describes the strength of the Lord. It was okay to be weak because God was strong and he knew where to turn. When David looked back at his victories, what he saw was in verse 6, a poor man who cried out and was saved from all his troubles. He didn't see someone who was, who was strong and overcame every, every obstacle. He saw someone who was poor and just cried out and something else had to save him. The more needy we are, the more humble we are, the more that we see that we need God for everything, the more that we know that, that we can only boast in God. When David looks back on his escapes and victories, he sees a deliverer. He sees a redeemer. 
The prideful will, will hear those things and say, but I've also done great things. I want part of the credit. But the humble, the humble will hear that. They will have, and they will see that we have nothing to boast about, nothing to boast in except, except God. And that should cause our hearts to rejoice and to be glad. The more humble we are, the more we are able to praise God with all of our hearts. Pride always diminishes our ability to exalt God, and so we should welcome this neediness, welcome humility into our hearts so that we can truly magnify the Lord. David now turns and invites others to join in with him. In verse 3, he says, Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. To magnify something means to look closely at it and, 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 and make it bigger in your sight. With most people, the closer you get to someone, the more you see their faults, their blemishes, their sins. With most things in this world, the closer you get, the more you see of its faults. We have two cars. We've, we name both of our cars. And one of our cars is named Shaky by our kids. Um, any guesses on why it's named Shaky? It shakes. Um, uh, sometimes really, really badly. My 11-year-old won't ride in that car, and my seven-year-old thinks it's the greatest car ever. <laughs> we found out about a week into owning that car that apparently the gas gauge on the car doesn't really work, and so when the car starts shaking, it means we're out of gas. And, uh, uh, and so we just kind of have to guess w when, when we need to put gas in. Um, when I first saw that car, I was in awe. It looked beautiful, comfortable. It was, it, was, it was amazing. And then after we bought it, we started to notice the scratches that we hadn't seen before. We, so the leather started to, to fade off immediately, and it wouldn't stop shaking. Um, with most of the things in this world, the more you look at it, the more you see its flaws. But with God, when you look closely, when you magnify the Lord, you will only see how perfect and complete and beautiful and loving he truly is. When you magnify the Lord, you get to see how good he truly is. When you focus on God, when you set your sight to look intently on God, everything else, even, even our suffering and our trials will seem smaller in comparison. Most of the time our suffering is so large in our eyes. God doesn't diminish our suffering. But it's so large in our eyes that we can't see how God is working. We can't remember how good God is because all we can see is how big our suffering is. And David is inviting people in the midst of that to see that God is, is so good and so great, such a present help in our suffering. So in the midst of our suffering, we are, he is calling us to magnify God. He is saying to those who read this, there's so much difficulty, there's so many things to fear, there's so much anxiety, but we have so many reasons to praise God forever. God is so good and so big and so perfect, so let's exalt and praise his name together. A number of pastors have pointed out that, that magnifying the Lord is like looking through a telescope. Telescopes take massive objects that look small to our human eyes and make them look, look more like what they really are. They are enormous beyond our capacity to comprehend. Pastor Jimmy mentioned looking at, at the planet Jupiter last week that it is a thousand times bigger than the earth. And yet, from my eyes... If I could possibly pick it out of the sky, it might appear a little bit larger, a little brighter than every other planet or star in the sky. I can know that something is huge and magnificent, but what does it mean to me if I look at it with my eyes and all I can see is something small and insignificant? That is how we often see God. We know, we've heard that he is big and powerful. But when we need him, when we look for him, 
He often seems distant and disconnected from our lives. We can look and say, I know you're there, but you're not that great right now. And that is why this idea is so important. When we magnify the Lord, we don't make him larger than he is. We can never make him greater than he truly is. We are just striving to see him clearly for how great and glorious he truly is. We are trying to adjust our eyes and our vision so that we can see how beautiful and magnificent God truly is. God is is enormous beyond what we can comprehend. He is powerful beyond what we can measure. And so we magnify the Lord and we need others to join us in this. This, this, this magnifying, this praising, this exalting that we are called to do, it is not something that we need to do alone. David felt alone in this moment, and yet he was looking to a time where he would be together with other people that could join him in making much of God. This isn't just a command, it is an invitation. It is an invitation to magnify God together so that we can just taste and see how good the Lord really is. It is an invitation that can confidently say that all that look to God, their faces are going to change. Their faces will be radiant. You will never be ashamed. You will will have a joy and a peace that will overwhelm you and that will radiate from you. Why would you not want to invite everyone you know to taste and see just how good God is? This is why we gather together each and every week. We need this consistently. Each week through prayer, singing, hearing God's word, we are seeking to magnify the Lord together, to remind each other of all that God has done for us in Christ. I know it can be hard sometimes to get up and come to church each Sunday, but it is so valuable. We should long to be together together to proclaim the greatness of God. In our lives, through our words, we want to magnify the truth and beauty and worth of God in Christ to each other. I need I need this. I need others to magnify the Lord so that when I'm struggling to see it, when I'm struggling to realize it. When the cares of this world just feel like they're choking things away, I need others to magnify the Lord. God uses them to remind me of how magnificent he truly is. This afternoon, we are going to magnify the Lord together and celebrate God's work through baptism. We have several people that will be baptized down at the river today, and, and, and they will be magnifying the Lord and the work that he has done in their lives. And we will all be reminded of the the, the amazing grace that God has shown each of us, the amazing work that God has done through Christ in saving his people, in taking them from spiritual death to full and abundant life in Christ. Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. This is our lives. This is what we're meant to do each and every day, not just on Sundays. So David then spends much of the rest of this psalm magnifying the Lord. Just want to look briefly at, at, at how he does this through this psalm. David just shows us what it looks like to magnify the Lord. He reminds us again and again that when the Lord saves, when he delivers, when he redeems, he does it completely and fully. Not barely Not partially, not sometimes, but fully, completely, and forever. Jen and I will celebrate our our 24th anniversary tomorrow. Um, We often meet with couples and we will share with them some of the rules that we have figured out when we are in conflict, one of some of the rules when we are in an argument um, that that we live by, and one of them is that we will not use extreme language. And so we don't use words like never, always, and every time. Those words are always unhelpful and they are never true when you're in conflict. Um, But here in the best possible way, David is using these, these words. Psalm 34 uses this extreme language to accurately point to all that God has done for us. 
He uses this language to magnify God, to help us see God clearly. This is a psalm about David being rescued from his enemies, but it is also a psalm for every single one of God's people to know that they will be delivered and rescued from every enemy, from every fear. In verse 4, we are told that he delivered me from all my fears. In verse 5, for all those who look to God, their faces shall never be ashamed. In verse 6, God says, he says, God saved David out of all his troubles. In verse 9, David says, all the saints who fear God lack nothing. In verse 10, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. In verse 17, the Lord delivers the righteous out of all their troubles. In verse 19, the Lord delivers the righteous out of all their afflictions. And in verse 22, we receive the promise that none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. How does David magnify the Lord for us? By reminding us of how fully and completely God works in our lives. All of God's people are delivered from all their fears, all their troubles, all their afflictions. They lack no good thing. What else in the world can possibly give that kind of hope? Their faces will never be ashamed. It is easy when we are going through a difficult situation to question, will God work this time? Is God able? Will God save us out of this trouble? Will he deliver us from this affliction? What about these fears? And David's answer here in Psalm, 35, Psalm 34 is that the answer to those questions is always a resounding and bold yes. Yes, he will deliver. Yes, he will rescue. Yes, he will save. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 tells us no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Everything that God has promised is yes in Jesus. God doesn't promise that we will never have troubles. He doesn't promise that there will never be anything to fear. He doesn't promise that we won't feel brokenhearted and we won't feel crushed. But there is no situation, there is no problem, there is no trouble that God cannot and will not redeem and deliver his people from. There is no one that is brokenhearted that God will not completely heal and comfort. We see this most clearly in the cross. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with, with him graciously give us all things? Jesus gave his life to save us from our sins to save us from the penalty of our sins and death, to save us from our fears, to deliver us from our brokenheartedness. And if God was going to give his own son for all of, all of that, then we do not need to wonder if he cares. We do not need to question and wonder if he is going to deliver us. We do not need to wonder if he's going to fulfill the rest of his promises. During those years, 15 years ago, where I genuinely questioned whether God was for me or against me, I believed in my heart that God was withholding from me. I consistently wondered if God really heard me. It was during this time that God reminded me of these words I gave my son. Why would I withhold anything else? He reminded me that those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. He gave us his son. Why would he withhold anything else from us? And even though my circumstances hadn't changed, I was able to praise God even while I cried out to him in my pain. There was still suffering. There was still difficulty. But my heart moved to praise and to exalt God. Throughout this psalm, David has been looking back at what God has done. And now at the end of this psalm, David is looking forward at Jesus, directly at our, at our coming Savior. In verses 17 through 22, David says, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, 
saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants. How? By the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. Why? Because Jesus has already taken that condemnation in our place. Jesus is near to you when you are brokenhearted. He is the one that puts us back together when we feel crushed. He is the one that weeps with us when we are weeping. He came into this world. He came close to us. And so he hears us when we cry out. He cares for us when we are hurting. And if God can bring the most possible good out of the death and crucifixion of his own son, Jesus, then we can have confidence today that he can bring good out of every difficult situation. There is coming a day, there is coming a day when we will be able to look back on our lives and we will see clearly that there was never a single moment when God was not good to you. There is coming a day where you will see clearly that there was not a single moment when God ever left you. Not a day that went by that he forgot you. One day we will clearly see that in our entire lives there was not a single promise that God did not fulfill. There was not one good thing that he withheld from us. You will be able to see clearly that goodness and mercy has followed you all the days of your life. It might be difficult to see that today. It might be difficult to believe that today, but it is absolutely true. Only God can provide that. Only God can, can promise that, can give us the confidence that we need. And that should lead us to confidently praise and magnify God together today and every day. Uh, as we close, I would, I would like to invite you to stand one more time, if, if you're able. Um, David calls us to magnify the Lord and exalt his name together. So as we read the first 10 verses at the beginning of this sermon, we're going to read together the end of this psalm as, as a way to magnify God together, uh, to, to proclaim what he has done. I know that we are hurting and suffering in many various ways but, but we are still, as God's people, called to magnify the Lord together. So read with me Psalm 34, verses 17 through 22. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Father, we, we cry out to you now. We cry out to you for, for help from hearts that are hurting. We know and we trust that you hear us, that you will deliver, that you will save, that you will heal. Father, there is nowhere else that we can turn to find those things. And so in the midst of, of, our, of our difficulties, we turn to you. Uh, remind us of this today. Remind us of this tomorrow um, as, as we go through various difficulties in our, in our lives Father, remind us of this consistently, that you are at work, that you are doing great and mighty things. Um, Father, let us hear others magnify the Lord and, and let that help our hearts to trust in you. Father, we need you at all times. We humbly come before you and just say that we are needy. And we, we ask that you would just do the work that you have promised to do. We trust that you will do it. Transform us by those things. Transform our lives. Transform the way we are with one another. Transform the way we are with those who don't know you. Do great and mighty things through it all. 
Father, we need you for everything, and we praise you because you so perfectly supply for all our needs. We ask all this and present it in Jesus' name. Amen.